Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts and I'm here to introduce and welcome Ken Aletta, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Ken is here today to discuss Googled, the end of the world as we know it. Ken Aletta, Ken Aletta tells the story of how Google was formed and then crashed in traditional media businesses, from newspapers to books, to television, to movies, to telephones, to advertising, to Microsoft. With unprecedented access to Google's founders and executives, as well as to those in media who are struggling to keep their heads above water, a letter reveals how the industry is being disrupted and redefined. Using Google as a stand-in for the digital revolution, Aletta takes readers inside Google's closed-door meetings and paints portraits of Google's notoriously private founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, as well as those who work with and against them. In his narrative, Aletta provides the fullest account ever told of Google's rise, shares the secret sauce of Google's success, and shows why the worlds of new and old media often communicate as if residents of different planets. Distilling the knowledge accrued from a career of covering the media, Aletta will offer insights into what we know and don't know about what the future holds for the, this imperiled industry. Ken Aletta has written the Annals of Communications column for The New Yorker since 1992. He is the author of 10 books, including four national bestsellers. These include Three Blind Mice, How the TV Networks Lost Their Way, Greed and Glory on Wall Street, The Fall of the House of Lehman, and World War 3.0, Microsoft and Its Enemies. In naming him America's premier media critic, the Columbia Journalism Review said, no other reporter has covered the new communications revolution as thoroughly as has Ken Aletta. Please join me in welcoming him to discuss Googled, the end of the world as we know it. Thank you. It's nice to be back here. Um, it still rains, though. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's always shocking to me when I come here how often it rains. Um, last time I was here, I think, was about a year ago, when I, or a year and a half ago, when I went to your, your conference with advertisers right. um, and your cashback program, which I haven't heard much from since. <laughs> uh, in any case, um, I had, um, I, I report in the book about a dinner party that um, Larry Page went to several years ago, and he was asked, someone, the host went around the, the room and said, um, what's the most important thing the government could do in your judgment? And they went around, and people said various things, and Larry Page said this absolutely ridiculous thing. He said, colonize Mars. <laughs> and, well, we haven't succeeded at that, but Google has semi-succeeded at colonizing Earth. Um, and back when they started in 1998, um, it was hard to imagine that would happen. In fact, in 1998, and I also tell this story, the beginning of, I think, chapter two, I was interviewing Bill Gates on this campus. And I said to Bill, I said, what do you worry most about when you think about the future? And I thought he would say Netscape or Oracle or Apple or Sun Microsystems. Instead, he, he, he thoughtfully said, I'll tell you what I worry about. I worry about some guy in a garage who's inventing some new technology I've never thought about and that's going to come back and bite Microsoft in the rear end. Well, in 1998, two guys were in a garage, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, and they've bitten you in the ass and a lot of other people in the ass. And this is a book about this company who they are, uh, and how they've disrupted uh, many other businesses, particularly media businesses, um, in the world. It's called Googled, as you said. Um, and in many ways, Google has changed our lives. Uh, the information made information, the, inf the internet made information available. Google search made it accessible. And that's a profound change. But it's also changed, more profoundly, the world of media that I spend my New Yorker hat time covering. And if you think about that, Google started as a search engine in 98. It now calls itself, by 2005, it was calling itself 
a media company. In fact, Eric Schmidt said to me at one point, uh, I think we might be the first $100 billion media company. That's a pretty big ambition. And if you think about that, they start from an assumption that Larry Page and Sergey Brin bring, which is that everything that most people do is inefficient. An engineer's job is to end those and eradicate those inefficiencies. And they start with a single question, um, why? So why can't Google make telephone calls and service for free? Why can't Google, which buys YouTube in late 06, why can't it put television, be a cable television or broadcast television for free on YouTube? Why can't Google replace media buying that advertising agencies do and charge 4 or 5% for? Why can't it just do it for a much smaller fee and much more efficiently only charging people when they click on an ad or purchase something? Why can't we digitize all the books ever made in the world? They're 20 million by rough estimates. And why can't we just do that? Uh, why can't we aggregate newspapers and magazines as Google News, starting in 2004, began to do, and now aggregates 25,000 newspapers and magazines from around the world? Why can't we, instead of buying Microsoft's packaged software, why can't we have cloud computing much more cheaply and give, you, and give a, a user much more portability? I learned in doing this book that the traditional media world was very slow to react. In fact, they were shocked. I began I begin the book with the story of Mel Carmazan, who was one of the first traditional media representatives to visit Google. He did this in 2000, early 2003. He was then the, C, the COO, the head of Viacom, which was then the second largest media company after Disney in the world. MTV, CBS, Simon & Schuster, a, a, a giant company. And he visits there, and he thought, among other things, he'd sell them a Super Bowl ad, which would then go in for $2 million for a 30-second spot. And he'd tell them about CBS, and he'd see, at, at, and the other holdings of Viacom and see if there's some way they might do business together. But he also thought it would be valuable to learn something about Google. So he's there about three hours. He has their free food. And he's taken around. He's introduced to the chef, who was the chef for the Grateful Dead. And they thought he'd be impressive. And of course, he's, all he's thinking about is how wasteful this was to give free food to employees. And who cares about the Grateful Dead chef? And, and, and they, of course, are thinking, this guy, you know, He's telling them about how he sells ads, which is, you know, you got to create buzz and you got to create emotion and get people real stirred up so they'll spend more money on your ads. And, and they say, well, do they know whether the ads work or not? And he said, we don't want them to know whether the ads work. We just want to create an emotional psychology that it really works. And they said, that's very inefficient. And Carmazan, it took him a while, but he, he, he leaves at the end, near the end of the meeting, he looks at at Larry and Sergey and Eric Schmidt, the CEO. And he says, and you'll forgive my language, but it's in the book, so he said, you're fucking with the magic. <laughs> and of course, at the annual, at the weekly TGIF meeting at, at Google that, that Friday, Larry Page and Sergey Brin get up and describe the meeting that they had with this guy who came to visit us. And you know what he said to us? He said, we're fucking with the magic. He said, imagine that. And of course, they delighted in that because that's how they see themselves, that they are messing with the magic. And that's what they want to do. And companies like Carmazons and companies like the New York Times and companies like CBS and, and the movie studios and the music companies and, and, and so many others and Microsoft was slow to wake up to the reality of the ambitions of a company like Google and how it was disrupting their business model. And I came away from this experience, by the way, with, with, with um, great impatience when I hear my colleagues in journalism uh, whine about the, the internet, be it you guys or Google or anyone else that's, that's disrupting and changing their business model. And, 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 pine, and pine for the good old days that are never going to come back. And, 
And I, I actually think if you go back, they will come back at you as they do to me as I was reporting this book. Because this book is, is about 150 interviews in this book with Google, but, and, and a lot of time spent to Google. But it's about 150 interviews with traditional media people as well. And the, the tension in the book is, is as Google, ex as you tell the Google story and Google begins to realize it can expand, it's when these people wake up and realize, oh my God, they're coming at and how come we didn't know this? And that's a good question. How come they didn't know this? I mean, how come when newspapers set up their websites, they didn't, they, they, they put the websites under the direction of the editor of the print newspaper? not realizing that a website, an online newspaper is a totally different vehicle with, with multimedia dimensions, unlike the newspaper. And how come the music companies insisted on selling packaged CDs where you have to buy the whole CD rather than what Apple did with iTunes, which is individual songs that you could buy? You know, and, and, and how, come the, how come traditional broadcasters or cable companies didn't invest in, in the digital world? in an aggressive way. I mean, when I, I did the book you mentioned, Three Blind Mice, which, which came out in, in, um, in 91. And that was a book about another transformative technology, cable, that was disrupting the broadcast industry and how late they were to understand what happened. Same thing has happened, happened to traditional me all traditional media because of not understanding what the digital world, Google being a surrogate for that, that world, would do. I also learned something about engineers. I would sit in the Google meetings and, and literally understood maybe half the words spoken. And it, they were talking Swahili to me. Yeah. But I had, a, I had a tape recorder and I could go back and, and play Columbo and, and ask honest questions. You know, wh what does that word mean? And what, what, was, what were they saying, et cetera? And I had the luxury of time to do that and maybe wrap my brain around, belatedly around some of these things. But I kept on thinking as I watched Eric Schmidt an engineer and Larry Page and Sergey Brin, all engineers, challenging the engineers. I kept on thinking of Terry Semmel sitting in the Yahoo meetings, or John Scully a decade before, a couple decades ago, sitting in the in the in the in the Apple meetings. Both non-engineers, both marketing guys, and I kept on thinking, is this why Yahoo and is this why Apple fell back because in engineering because they had marketing people who couldn't understand what the engineers would, were saying and couldn't challenge them. So I, I was awed by, by the, the experience that the engineer in your world is really the Martin Scorsese's. They are the content creators. They're the people who create uh, the applications and, and the things that make Google a media company. And, and I came to appreciate that some, but I also came to appreciate something else about the engineering culture there, which is that engineers are very good at things they can quantify. They're not very good at things they can't quantify, like fears. By the way, I experienced the same thing when I, 10 years ago when I did a book on Microsoft. I sat with, with, with your folks, including Bill Gates, and covered the trial in Washington. And it was stunning to me how how Microsoft, th this disconnect that existed between how Microsoft viewed itself, a, a uniform operating system was something that, that was like building one set of railroad tracks and, and, and that worked for everybody and wasn't that wonderful. So Gates and Microsoft really thought you were doing good things. Now you also were doing some harm, but, but, you, but that's not what you saw. You saw that you were, you were doing an advance and the thought that the government of the United States might come at Microsoft and say that Microsoft was a monopolist, was abusing its power, was really alien to, to Microsoft's way of looking at the world. Same is true of Google today. Google can't believe that the government, not just the United States, but the European Union and China and India and other governments are questioning them. And so there's this disconnect. And so when you ask Sergey Brin, what, what, as I did, what do you think, for instance, the most important uh, privacy issue is. He says it's false things written about people on the internet. I mean, imagine that. I mean, you're talking about someone who lives in a very narrow world and doesn't understand why people would be frightened of the cookies and the information that Google collects 
on those cookies and how it might be abused, particularly if you're in the advertising business and advertisers are clamoring for that data that they like to have. So I, it was stunning to me, uh, this disconnect between the engineering culture and the, and the culture of the world outside, which is beginning to ask questions of Google. I also tell the story, and we were talking about it earlier, about um, uh, in my, I think it was my second interview with, with Sergey Brin. He came in on rollerblades, and, and he dropped his knapsack down, and, and he said, Ken, I got a question for you. He said, tell me why you don't just Instead of printing this book, you don't just publish it online for free. You'll get a much larger audience. <laughs> and I said, well, I might get a larger audience. I might not. But who would, I mean, I'm on leave from the New Yorker to report this book. Who would pay me? How would I earn a living if I did this? And he said, oh. I said, let me ask you a couple of more questions. I said, <laughs> I said who would pay for all my trips out here? Oh. I said, who would edit my book? Oh. Who would do my marketing plan? Who would send me on a book tour like I'm on now? Oh. Who would do the index? Who would legally bet the book? Oh, 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 oh. And he wants to change the subject. But what that suggested to me is, was, was really naivete. I mean, he's ignorant of the world of publishing. He's flying at 30,000 feet. He doesn't understand it. But it suggests something else, which is an attitude that a fair number of people you encounter, and you, you're as familiar with this as I am, I'm sure, <laughs> information should be free. That was the attitude that, that Sergey Brin was, was reflecting. It, it should be free. It just should be out there. And in fact, I told this story in, in, a, in an exchange, online exchange. I'm trying to remember. I've done it, so many of them in the last two weeks. But it, it was on. And then, then you see all these people that post things afterwards. And they said, well, that is right. He's just a troglodyte. I mean, why should he be paid? Why should he be paid for anything he does? He doesn't get the new world. And you get all this stuff, you know, you, hey, you're an old Fogey, you don't you know, understand this world. And I laugh at this stuff. I mean, I find that this so preposterous. And some of the culture in the valley, which is that's reflective of, is, is actually does make me laugh. I mean, I, I would have people tell me, and of course, I wasn't laughing at the time because I'm a reporter. I just, what's your name? I just write it down and tape record everything. And I just listen and then you know, write something at the end that someone may not like. But, um, but they would say to me, has there ever been a more transformative technology than, than the Internet? I mean, this has never happened in the history of the world, they would say to me. This is amazing what the Internet says. I said, let me ask you this. What about electricity? They said, what do you mean? I said, how would you have an Internet without electricity? Don't you think that's more transformative? I don't even go to Gutenberg. You know, or, <laughs> I'm not even talking about that. I mean, just, let's just, just stay with electricity and Thomas Edison. You know? And of course, they shut up. But the truth of the matter is, there is something that's different, I found, and I learned this as well, or crystallized this thought in my mind. One of the things that's really different about this age is, is, is the speed, the velocity things move. If you think about it, it took electricity about 70 years to reach half the American public. It took television four decades to reach half the American public. It took the internet 10 years. It took Facebook five years to reach 300 million people. The speed with which the world is changing and moving is extraordinary. And one of the things you find, and I, I particularly in traditional media, but, but you find that I think it's everyone in this room feels it, I feel it, is that speed makes everyone insecure. Of course, you don't know what's going to happen next. You're back to Bill Gates. I worry about that guy in the garage. And Google today, as secure as they seem, as impregnable as they seem, and Bing has, has, you know, is a worthy rival to them, but your market share growth has not been appreciable since you introduced it. Um, but it's a good search engine. But Google seems very strong. But they worry about this change, probably not enough. Uh, but one of the reasons they'll, they'll deny this, it happens to be true. Sergey Brin has denied it. He said, I didn't know about it, but I don't know about it, he said. But one of the reasons they tried to buy Twitter last spring was that they worry about vertical search. They worry that what if someone could do a search on social networks like Twitter or Facebook? What if you could consult your friends on a camera you might want to buy and instead of getting, as I did when I asked the question of a Google search, 
who is a real William Shakespeare? How many answers do you think I got? If you read the book, don't, don't answer the question. You, you know the answer. How, does anyone have a guess? How many? More than 10. What if I said 5 million? Now, that's totally useless. That's totally inefficient from engineers to give me 5 million responses. I don't have time to, to go through that. But what if I, I could go for the camera and get 12 responses from friends and, who I trust? This is a great camera. This is a lousy camera, whatever. It, it'd be as good, it'd be better than a, a Google search with thousands of answers. So they really worry about that. What they, they probably don't worry enough. They work, so they, they know they have external threats. That's one external threat. They know that government, they were very late to understand this, but now they're catching up, as you guys were late to understand, that government is a great bear that could really harm you. And, and they know they're not just dealing with the bear in Washington. They're dealing with the bear in the European Union and China and India and everywhere else in the world. So they're, they're more aware of that threat. But then you have the internal threats. Arrogance, hubris. Um, it's hard when you're that strong and powerful and, and you come through the recession as well as they have so far. They're still growing, slow growth, but still growing. They improve their management, their cost controls. But it's very easy to ignore and, and, and to feel like you're virtuous and how could anyone question me and not change because of that. So they have some of the same issues they face today that you faced 10 years ago that any great company, and you are a great company, faces. And where this all turns out, I don't know. Um, I do know that the world of, of media is, is going to change fast and has changed fast. And I worry about some of it. I worry about, for instance, the world I'm in, which is journalism. I worry what happens to it. Um, the blogosphere is not going to replace the New York Times in Afghanistan or Iraq and, and, and is not going to do the kind of investigative reporting that, that we all need in a, in a democracy. So I worry about that. I worry about whether you can charge on the web the way Apple successfully does with iTunes or Match.com does with dating. Um, and one of the things that surprised me when I think about the future is that I've seen a shift in attitude uh, on people. For instance, Mark Andreessen, your dear friend, um, it said to me that, that he is this far away from trying to get people's credit card numbers for Ning, his social network. And John Hennessy, the, the president of Stanford, who was the head of the computer science department there, who's on the board of Google, uh, said to me, we made a mistake when we set up the internet. He said, we should have charged. And we should have created that notion. Eric Schmidt, when I told him what Hennessy said to me last December, December of, of 08, he said, I disagree with John. I think free is the best model. When I interviewed Eric Schmidt the last time in April of this year, I said, do you still agree with what you said in December about free? He said, no, I've changed. I think what has happened is because of the recession and the realization that the dependence on advertising, which was shrinking, was very dangerous uh, and that they needed to figure out another revenue stream, <laughs> just as the TV networks. That was one of the challenges they faced in cable. Cable had two revenue streams, subscriptions and, and advertising, and broadcast television had only one, advertising. And they realized they needed another revenue stream. And so the world is changing fast in this regard. Now, whether you can change the culture and get people to pay for something they assume is free, like Sergey Brin assumed my book should be free, I don't know whether that's, that's going to happen. If it does, it's actually a hopeful sign for journalism that maybe there's some way they could they can monetize the digital world. I know this, uh, this I can be certain, and all of us can be certain. The world is going to be very different tomorrow than it is today. Um, and th there's a basic question that any individual faces. And, and it's whether you do what traditional media did, which is lean back and say, I'm going to hold this off. 
I'm not going to make an investment. I'm going to be defensive. I'm going to whine. I'm going to complain. I'm going to go to the government. I'm going to do whatever I do. But I'm not going to do what I should be doing, which is lean forward and be proactive and say, how do I, how do I deal with the digital world? What do I do to ride that wave rather than crash into it? And that's a basic question for everyone. It's a question. It, it, there's a great book called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, a Harvard professor. And, and in that book, he tells the story of great companies that, didn't, that, that crashed into ways because they were protecting their existing business. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it, guys? Protecting their existing business and not being proactive and saying, how do we find that garage, that new technology, and ride that wave? And it's a tough choice because it means sometimes you've got to jettison. You're taking resources away from your profitable existing business. But if you're thinking about the future, sometimes you've got to make that sacrifice. It's tough. Anyway, love to take your questions. Yes. Uh, yesterday or this morning, Rupert Murdoch was interviewed, uh, <laughs> um, uh, putting forth a view, uh, maybe he was doing it to be a contrarian, but I mentioned your perspective. I know I think you met with him and covered him a fair amount in the past about basically taking his newspaper sites out of the Google index and uh, putting it all behind a paywall. And I'm just interested in your smart man, genius of the past era of media. You know, what's your sense of how he's thinking about things and his experience with MySpace and sort of doing things like perhaps retracting <coughs> of the new era? So <coughs> he, um, you know, Murdoch, when he bought Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, he went in with an attitude that it's crazy for the journal to have a paywall and to charge. When they then educated him and showed him that the Wall Street Journal dot, dot com generates $100 million a year, uh, he said, oops. I mean, he was thinking that, that if you have no paywall, you obviously have many more readers. You can charge advertisers more money. But the bird in hand was $100 million. So he reversed himself. And he basically said, we're going to keep the Wall Street Journal behind a paywall. Now what he's saying, and it drives him crazy, that, and it drives people in, uh, in, in journalism crazy, it drives me crazy, you know, that, that, that you, you produce content and, you, you, and news aggregators can use it, and, and yes, they take you to your site. If you do a search and you get a, New York, a Google search, let's say, or a Bing, you'll get two or three lines, and then there'll be a link, you go to the New York Times, and the New York Times can sell ads off of that which is great. And, and the argument that, that you would make or Google would make is that you're increasing your readership, which is, which is what Sergey Brin, the argument he made to me about putting my book online. The question is, can you monetize it? And it, it is totally inefficient to, to print a newspaper, to kill trees, to expensive paper, expensive printing plants, expensive pollution belching trucks to distribute that. It would be great if it could all be online. It's portable, as a newspaper is portable, it doesn't get all over your fingers, and it's cheap to do. The basic problem is that an ad online gets one-tenth the amount of money. You charge one-tenth of what you can charge for an ad, that same ad in a newspaper. So the economics don't work. Will they work one day? I don't know. But then you get to other problems that addresses your question. Murdoch wants to do this, and the New York Times, I think, wants to do this, and the Washington Post, and a lot of other newspapers want to do it. And, and the, the Attorney General has telegraphed that, that he would, might look away from the question of whether this, you know, this is, violates the antitrust laws for these newspapers to meet and agree on this. But even if they meet and agree, a question is, will all newspapers do it? Christian Science Monitor now publishes six days a week online. Right? You have a paper in Seattle that is just an online newspaper. The, eight, the wire services, they're not going to get behind it. They're, they're not going to do that. So if every newspaper doesn't do it, then, then you get around the paywall that way, right? And, and, and the worry that newspapers have that the digital world is making commoditizing newspapers becomes more pronounced. It becomes a commodity. You don't know where you got that piece of information about Afghanistan from now. The value of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal brand is lessened. You just got it. It could be from the AP. It could be from Bloomberg. It could be from Christian Science Monitor. Second, can you change the culture of the web, go back to that question, to get people to, to pay? Big question. 
Three, what about hackers? Is the, is the paywall impregnable? Can you get around it? Basic question. So whether it works or not, I don't know. But I think if, you f follow, if I follow my own logic about leaning forward and being proactive, I think newspapers have to try that. They have to try some, something. Uh, whether it's that exact model, I don't know. But it may not work. But they've got to try a lot of things. But what did the New York Times do? In addition to what the point I made about, uh, about their, they have a very good online newspaper today. But at, at first, they weren't allowed to break news, and the online had to wait till it appeared in the paper the next morning, and, and, they, and it was in charge uh, by the head of the newsroom, not the, not the online. And they, they buy, what have they done the last 10 years? They bought television stations in small markets, which they've since sold. They put $2 billion to buy back their stock, which is now at, you know, in pennies, worth pennies almost, or single-digit dollars. They, they, they bought uh, Discovery cable, Digital Cable for $600 million, which they've since sold. I mean, you're talking about companies, and that's, I think, the best newspaper in the world, that really over the last 10 years has been really foolish and didn't do what business people are supposed to do, which is protect journalism by having a good, strong business. Murdoch is, cares newspapers are in his blood. He has not harmed the journal as I feared he would. Um, it's a good newspaper. Um, he looked like he was at the top of the digital wave when he bought MySpace in 2005. Now he looks like he's crashing into the digital wave with, with MySpace. So, you know, they're going to try it, but whether it works, I don't know. Yes? Um, something about your thoughts on when Google happened um, and other folks that were in the market and why they didn't get it. And like specifically, is InfoSeek and Disney's venture been on your radar at all? Well, I, tell, I actually had told this a story of, of, um, of I, Michael Eisner um, was, tells a story. I had actually written the last chapter for the book. It was called Media Max. It was a coda. And it was going to be called Media Maxims. And it was going to say, these are the things I've learned covering the media and covering Google and covering you guys, et cetera, about the media world. And I told the story about um, Michael Eisner being in the bathroom at the urinal, standing next to Steve Bornstein, who was his digital chief, the guy who started, was one of the early starters of ESPN. And Bornstein said to him, they own go.com, right? And he said, you know, this is, this is by the way, I, I believe it's, it's 98. Um, he says, you know, our people want to do search and they, wanna, they think we can advertise, we can do advertising. And, but I don't know that it's real, he says to Michael, he says, I don't know, Michael, that it's really Disney-esque for us to be doing ads on search. And, and Michael says, I, I agree with you, Steve, we shouldn't do it. And so when I interviewed Eisner, who told me this story, he said his lesson from that story is that don't make decisions in the bathroom. <laughs> and, and, and he said it was really a stupid decision on my part. And, and, and you know, by the way, you bought a company in, in 98, you know, and they came to you, and this was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal last year. They came to you and said, you know, search, we can do advertising on it, and Microsoft didn't bite. So a lot of people make a lot of mistakes at a lot of different times in history. Um, and it happens. And, and you move on. Does that answer your question? Yes? Your, your query, who's going to index a book if nobody gets paid? Seems to me the obvious answer is Google will index a book. They index the whole world. They can certainly index a book. Yeah, but, but, now, but then they're, they're forced. What happened, Larry Page in 2002, is um, Eric Schmidt walks down his office and Larry Page has a Lego set. And he says, Larry, Eric Schmidt says, what is that? And he says, it's, it's a scanner. I'm going to scan all the books in the world. He said, how are you going to do that? You're just Larry. He says, how are you going to get access to books? And he says, well, I'll go to the University of Michigan where I graduated and I'll talk to the library there. And, and, and then Eric says, well, yeah, Al Gore, who's an advisor, knows people at the Library of Congress. They go to Stanford, Hennessy, and you know, they go to New York Public Library. And they go to all these libraries, Oxford, and they get permission to 
to do this, and this is great. And they're all excited. They're going to digitize all the world's work. Who didn't they talk to? The people who own the copyright, the publishers and authors. Hello? Anybody home? I mean, so it, it's again, so you, you're forced then, then they get a lawsuit, and they're forced to say, oh my God. And they're supposed to have a hearing today, and you told me that it was postponed to next week, I guess, right? The judge is, is about to rule on that. And Microsoft knows, not Microsoft, Google knows it's going to have to amend its current agreement some. Um, but that's reality. And China was reality for them, too. You know, uh, hello, we don't want you to, um, we don't want searches on Tiananmen Square, except, uh, which talk about any tanks or <laughs> people getting hit over the head. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, you, you mentioned a Cold War with Facebook. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on the Facebook-Google uh, competition and also on Apple, the relationship, the rather evolving relationship with Apple? Uh, but before you do, great book. Finished Thanks. it last night. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. I have some money for it. <laughs> um, we got actually go back away. We, we, when I was covering Microsoft trial, um, it, um, Google is very concerned about Facebook, and they're concerned about anyone who has occupies your time. And one of the things you learn when you in this world is that content is anything that that captures your eyeball or ear, your attention, and. Facebook captures a lot of attention. And Google worries that Facebook will become what AOL once was, your, your private internet, your little cul-de-sac on the internet, and detracting them, not to mention them doing search. So there's a lot of rivalry. And, and when they signed up with you guys as a minority investor, believe me, that was well noted at, at Google and just increased their, their concern. Um, Facebook is, is equally aware of, of Google. Um, Sheryl Sandberg, who was the ranking op officer at Google, who's, who's a character in my book, who left um, in March of 08 <coughs> and went to Facebook as their COO um, and has a good relationship here, you know, it just increases the tension. Uh, there was upset that Cheryl, Cheryl left, and, and particularly upset that she then went to, to Facebook. So there's a lot of concern. Eric Schmidt comes out of a world where you are the evil empire. Um, he thought that when he was at Sun Microsystems. He thought that when he was at Novell. He was one of the people who talked to the Justice Department, uh, as did a lot of other people, some of them anonymously. He was not anonymous um, about Microsoft. When he came to Google in 2001, he he, what he did was he said, Sergey, Larry, I know you come out of the world of the valley where, where Microsoft is the evil empire. Um, and uh, don't make the mistake that Netscape made of mooning the giant. Just be quiet. And they were until fairly recently, last couple of years. And, and now they're quite open about their ambitions and, and how they bump into you. With Apple, it's, it's actually, uh, that's really interesting, I find. Because when you ask Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who do you admire? Steve Jobs is near the top of their list. He's heroic. In fact, when, they were, when their venture capitalists, John Doerr and Mike Moritz, were trying to push them to hire a CEO in 2000 and 2001, before they hired Eric Schmidt, they went through the motions of interviewing various people. Of course, they had no intention of hiring anybody. Uh, but they weren't making any money, and they didn't until late 2001 when they came up with AdWords. But what, what that they would say to John Doerr, what, let's go, we'd like to go see Steve Jobs. So they go see Steve Jobs, and after they said, that's who we want to hire. We want him to run our company. And they said, he's not going to do that. And it stopped diverting, you know. So what happened was that, that, that Eric Schmidt joined the board of, of, of Apple. Bill Campbell, who's a very significant figure at, at Google, he's called a coach there. And he, he spends roughly two days a week, Mondays and Tuesdays, at Google advising them. Um, he was a coach at Columbia football team. Uh, that's why he's called a coach. But he, he coaches people. He doesn't get paid. And he's, he's Steve Jobs' closest friend and was his lead director at Apple until he stepped down. And the reason he stepped down as the lead director this past spring 
was he went with Steve when Steve had his, his liver replacement. That's not known, but I know he did. And, and um, they're very close, but he didn't tell the board. And, and the board was upset because the, they said the lead director should be telling us. So he went to a lawyer, and the lawyer advised him, don't be a lead director, and, and there's not a problem. You can stay, stay Steve's friend. So he feels that since he's no longer lead director, he, he's not forced to give up his, his relationship with Google. But Art Levinson, who's on the board of both uh, Google and Apple, just quit the Google board. And, and the last person, question mark, is Al Gore, who's on the board of Apple and is an advisor to Google. What will he do? They are competing in, 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 with Android and uh, against iPhone, cloud computing, um, open source not. They're, they're, they're at each other's throat. And, and Eric, when he left the board of Apple, it was not entirely voluntary. He said to me in this, last time I interviewed him in April that he, he didn't plan to step down, and then he did. So Jobs knows that, that, that Google is coming at him. And the truth is, this illustrates that phrase that Martin Sorrell helped popularize, the head of the largest advertising agency, WP, everyone is a friend enemy. You, there, uh, the realization is that you're both a competitor and a foe and, and, and a collaborator with. Same true of, of Amazon. Jeff Bezos, I report in the book, was one of the four initial investors in, in Google. It was not known. Um, and he put up $250,000. And uh, loved, Sir, he told me he loved Sergey and Larry, loved their passion, was really excited <coughs> when he met them. If he had, kept, if he had held on to the, that investment when Google went public, he would have made $1.3 billion. Uh, you can't find out whether he did, and he wouldn't tell me whether he held it or sold it. But in any case, he knows that now they're competing electronic books. Google is going to be selling electronic books just as Amazon does, not to mention cloud computing. computing. So this is a very common th thing you find. So the Facebook battle is joined by every company's battle. Well, let me take someone I haven't asked. Yes. Um, what do you think about Wave? I've seen the demo of it, and some people say oh, it's just a variant on things that exist, and other people say it's the paradigm of the future. And I'm curious what you're I, Wave, came, Wave was announced three days after my book um, was, was done I, I, and uh, to bed. So I, I, did, I don't even mention Wave in the, in the book um, and have not spent enough time with it to be able to give you a an intelligent answer to that question. Um, you, yes? Um, you mentioned the government and the threat. Google seems to have done an incredibly impressive job with the Obama administration. And uh, the first term that I've seen, uh, and I've worked in the space within Microsoft, but the cover of Fortune this week has got a picture of the president, which is not very flattering with googly eyes. Um, <laughs> But the Google O and the you know yellow O and blue O or whatever. Um, how I guess the question is how have they been so effective uh, with this administration, uh, and how do you see that um, if you were to advise us from a competitive standpoint, how do we how would we take advantage of that, or what should Microsoft be doing differently? The uh, one of the things, one of the great advantages that, that Google has is that it's free. And it's very hard to compete against that. Uh, I mean, you're selling software and packages. They're, they're saying it's free. And, 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 and that, and, and the fact that when you do a Google search, you're not burdened by a big ad on the opening page, they keep it clean. And the fact that, they, that when you do a search, it takes you to the site of your choice, doesn't try and trap you in a Google site. Um, all of that builds a, an element of trust. Um, that, and then don't be evil. It's like Apple going after you guys, the evil empire, as, as they still do in the ad, very effective ads. Um, uh, none more effective than the 1984 ad uh, in the Super Bowl against you guys. So all of that gives a good feeling to Google. And so politicians feel comfortable that, that it's a, a good company. It's not an evil empire. It's not a, a giant that you worry about. But, and so when, when, when Obama went there in 2007 and spoke on campus, he gave a speech about an open net and, and other, you know, and, and there was music to the ears of not just Eric Smith, who became a big advisor to him, 
But David Drummond, who was one of his early and fervent supporters and is their chief counsel and is close to Obama, uh, but to other people who've now joined the administration who worked at Google. But Google would, would make a mistake if they don't understand a fundamental truth. Democrats are more interested in regulation than Republicans. And, and you think about the, the issues that might require regulation. Concentration of power, privacy, copyright. Those are three huge issues, and Google bumps into every one of them. So the notion that they're going to be immune because they have friends in the Obama administration, I suspect is a fallacy. And, and, and that um, they could run up against the same kind of issues that you guys did 10 years ago. Um, the, I don't know how you, 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 you Microsoft counters free. Um, that, that's a very potent message. I mean, one, one traditional media guy, very powerful media guy, who didn't want to be quoted because he was trying to do a deal with Google at the time I interviewed him, um, said, how do, you know, how do I deal with these? I mean, here we are. I have this giant company, and we, we, we're trying to do things, but we charge. And Google has this giant company, and they don't charge. How do I compete with free? It's very hard. And they have been, you know, and it's part of their self-concept, don't be evil. They really believe that, just as you did 10 years ago, that you were doing good. And, and so there's this disconnect. And a question is, will, will there be a disconnect with the government, and not just the US government, but other governments and, and Google? And I think there will be. I think there, you know, I think there already is. You see some evidence that that they have to make adjustments. And that's life. That, that's, uh, but free is a, they, they, won't be, they won't be universally thought of or near universally thought of as the evil empire in part because of the free thing, I think. Yes? Uh, the segue, I guess, off that, you know, it's free on, on one level, but certainly as a consumer, you're giving something up for that free service, and it's your information. And I guess, what is your what is your thinking now after spending time with them and kind of seeing these issues about what happens to them when when consumers become more aware of what they actually are giving up in this transaction? I think that's one of the menaces they face down the road. And and by the way, as search slows as it is, search search growth. Uh, and if they don't hit on one of the three bets they're making, YouTube, Android, or cloud computing as a growth potential growth engine. Uh, and it's not clear they will, um, then the pressure from advertisers to share more information, from, to get more information from Google, will intensify. And Google then will be faced with a basic question. Who's their customer, the user or the advertiser? And that's down the road a, a, an issue. But already we're seeing evidence, and by the way, this is true in Europe, where, where privacy is a much bigger issue than it is here. Uh, that Google is, is confronting some realities that privacy is a, is a huge atomic bomb out there that they got to address. And yet the data they collect is so incredibly valuable and so plentiful. That, and so as, as the public becomes more aware and as you move into things like behavioral advertising, which is something Google endorses, which is that you can read my mind in effect, you can know what I like, that I watch that ad, that I like that ad, how much time that I spend on that ad, what's my basic attitude, all rich data that advertisers would kill for. Because, it, it, again, it's not like selling ads like Mel Carmazon did. You know, it's not magic anymore. It's, it's data. And, you know, Google loves data. In fact, Google, when you ask Google about the ads, I actually don't spend a lot of time looking at the ads. But they estimate that 50% of the people who do a search Look at the ads. Of course, they view the ads not as ads, but as advertising, as information. And, and, that be, and so if you begin to think of it as, as information, then you might be more prone to share that information with the advertiser because you're, you're serving, you, you may delude yourself to think you're serving the, the consumer. In the end, if the consumer becomes alarmed, then it's a problem. There is a, there's a whole body of thought, and I know it's at Google, this body of thought, but I, I, I got it from, and I quote Barry Diller in the book as saying this, and I quote Erwin Gottlieb, who's the largest media buyer in the world, group, the CEO of Group M, as saying this, that privacy is not a big issue with the American public. And, because, and, and you say, well, 
You don't think they're worried about it? They said, we'll get around it. I said, how? And one of the ways they're thinking, they think about getting around it, it's very interesting, this is in, in my future section, that don't think of advertising as advertising. When you, think, when you pick up your mobile device, you're not going to have an ad, a 30-second ad the way you have on television. Excuse me, we interrupt your conversation because we want to bring you the 30 seconds. But that's not what, what the form is going to take. They're, they're thinking of, of the advertising as service. They have your GPS. They know where you are. So you want a restaurant? You're, you're, there are three that have tables available. How many in your party? Six. Just press this button and we'll reserve that. That's a service that someone's going to pay for, the restaurant or the, or the consumer. Or you're walking and they, you're walking by a, a shopping mall and Ken, we know you like, you like Florsheim shoes. I happen not to like Florsheim shoes, but I'm just throwing it out. And, 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 and they have a real sale. Would you be interested in that? That's a service. And that's how they're thinking about how to monetize cell, you know, mobile devices. And, and, but you know, that's a lot of information. Someone's watching me. I mean, I, I, I got a ticket in the mail the other day in, in New York City, and it was a one page from the Department of Finance of the City of New York, and there were three pictures of my car with my license plate on one of them going through a red light. I mean, I, what I'd done, it was on 3rd Avenue, it was on 69th Street, and I just dropped our daughter off, and I was driving, and the light had changed, but I was past the light. I clearly was guilty. And I say, Mr. Letter, here it is, $50, no points on your thing. So the camera's watching me, and they're going to be watching you on your, on your phone, too, in effect. So will at some point, I, I thought this was, you know, if, I can understand why we're bothered. I worry about that. On the other hand, I was nabbed. I was guilty, so I paid, and I didn't raise any questions. But someone on my cell phone and knowing everything, I mean, I, I once, for instance, looked at, if you do, you go Google Earth, find Steve Jobs' house. You can look in the windows. Now, that's pretty scary stuff. Maybe it's not as scary when you're dealing with Paris Hilton, but you want that in your, you know. Anyway, yes. Two questions about the newspapers and the new media that are, I think are closely related. One is, although they love to whine about Google and Google News and other you know, bloggers is taking their business away, haven't they actually lost far more revenue to Craigslist through the decline of classified advertising? And the other question is, it seems irrational to me that there should be this vast disparity between what they get for online ads and print ads. If online ads are only worth, really worth what they're paying for online ads, aren't advertisers vastly overpaying for print ads? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, yes, and one of the things the digital world does is show how inefficient advertisers are and in, in, in how they advertise. They basically use a shotgun and, and pray it hits something. And, and, and in the digital world, you know whether you hit something or not. The, the uh, Craigslist, the newspapers, uh, the rule of thumb is that classified advertising supply, once supplied a third of the reven advertising revenues for newspapers. That's almost all gone now. Craigslist, you know, eBay, et cetera, that, 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 that robs that. And, and that's a huge, huge loss. The, the, uh, but the newspaper industry in, 19, in 2000, did $31 billion a year of advertising. That is the amount of advertising they will do this year, 2009, $31 billion. Is that All newspapers, all advertising in all newspapers in the United States. So you're talking about a, a drop that's unbelievable. I mean, at one point, they were up to $50 billion. So it, it's, newspapers are in trouble. And, and, and the online ads are not going to make up that difference right now. The question is, at some point, will you get to a point where advertisers will see the effectiveness of those ads? People will actually pay attention to them, unlike me, online, and, and, and click, and, and it'll become an efficient marketplace for advertising, and then you'd be able to charge more. But so far, there's, that's the problem. The problem is you, you save money by not printing, but you don't make up enough in the online world to make up that difference. Even one more question. One more question, I'm told. In the back. I have a related question. Let's say you were mentoring a young kid who wants to go into writing or reporting. Mm -hmm. And you know that that person is talented. Um, 
and they're kind of looking to you to get some advice um, on that. What could the discussion be like, knowing everything that you know about well, I, I could be glib and say get another profession, but I, 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 I wouldn't do that. Actually, I had a 22-year-old a, a from the Pittsburgh Gazette did an interview with me last week about the book. And at the end of the interview, he, he asked your question. He said, what would you advise me to do? And, I, and I'll tell you exactly what the conversation was. I said, are you a good writer? And he said, I think I am. I said, that's good. And I said, are you conversant with the internet and the digital world? He said, yes. I said, that's good. What I would do if I were you, there's always going to be a premium for good writing, um, and particularly if he's a good reporter. And, and, and he seemed to be. He was asking good questions. Uh, he had read the book, and he, w he was following up with provocative, sometimes provocative questions. Um, but if, in fact, he's a good writer, I think there's a place for him. And if, in, in fact, he, he goes to places where he can be multimedia, not just in dead tree department, um, I think that's what you have to do. I mean, it's easier for me. The New Yorker is, is around a while. I'm not 22 years old anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm fine. You know? And I, actually, I think the New Yorker is fine. It, just as The Economist is fine. They're, they're, they're doing very well. Bad in advertising the last year and a half. But I think that will come back. I don't think that's going to happen. Newspaper advertising, I don't think will come back so easily. I mean, I, if, if he, for instance, the paper he works for, I think it's dead. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, dead. Like one of your two papers, dead. A lot of, a lot of Boston Globe, really problematic where they can survive. Even the LA Times, you know, which once had a million circulation, is down to probably 500,000 today and is really troubled for different reasons in their case. They, they, they have this sprawling area they've got to cover, so they're not local, and they can't afford to any longer try and compete with the New York Times as an international newspaper. But a lot of newspapers are going to die. And, and so I would say, get out of the Pittsburgh newspaper, buddy. You know, and, 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 and I'm sure if he's talented, he will. But I mean, it used to be, when, when someone asked me that question 15 years ago, in fact, a number of New Yorker secretaries and fact checkers did over the years ask me that question. And I would always say, go out of town and work for a small newspaper in Louisiana or someplace, get a, or the Variety or someplace, get a lot of clips that you can then come back and show to a New York City newspaper or Chicago newspaper. And that was, that was the model in the old days. I started at the Village Voice as a, as a kind of a model. You know, That model doesn't exist anymore. And, and, and um, you know, the New York Times not hiring people. Um, and they're, con they're actually contracting. So it's a, that world has changed dramatically. But that's what I would do. I would, I would, I would be multimedia. And, and I would, uh, if I'm a good writer, I would say, I got a shot. If you really want to do it. And you also have books, which are not going to go away. The, the problem in books is that the so-called mid-list books, they could be very serious books. They're more interested, as the movies are, in blockbusters and in sequels to John Clancy, et cetera. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's a little easy for me. I've had some bestsellers, so, you know, I can get an advance and I can still do. But that first-time writer, unless they write a great novelist, a novel, um, they're going to have a hard time getting an advance. And they may want to follow Sergey's advice and do it online. Though I have not seen a model for that that works. So it's, it's complicated to answer your question. A pleasure to really be here and come back to Microsoft, and thank you.